Good evening, Libertarians. My name is Dan Fishman. I am the Executive Director of the Libertarian Party, and I'm happy to welcome you to Libertarians at Large, where we bring all the at-large members to talk about issues that are facing the country during today. So today I'm joined, at least initially, by uh, Senator Laura Ebke in Nebraska and Eric Roudsepp in North Carolina. Guys, hey, thanks everyone. so much for being here. Absolutely. You guys have a good week of liberty? It's been a busy week in Liberty, I have to say. It's a good week, too. It, it has. We had all sorts of exciting things going on. I know we're going to talk a little bit later about uh, Ricky Dale Harrington and uh, his... Uh, can, we, can we call it a debate? What should we call that? It was amazing. It was amazing. Ama and amazing is a good thing to call it, too. Yeah. Uh, yes. What would you... Uh, what, what, do we call it a debate? Or actually... Why don't we do a little background for the people who don't know everything that happened? Uh, Laura, do you want to tell us the story about wh what happened? Well, sure. Um, uh, Ricky Harrington is the Libertarian Party candidate for U.S. Senate in Arkansas. Um, he's running against Senator Tom Cotton. And uh, PBS scheduled a debate. And um, I don't know all of the details, Dan, maybe you'll have to fill us in, but um, a, as I understand it, um, Senator Cotton said, I'm not showing up. And PBS said, well, we're going to have it anyhow. And so um, Ricky Harrington got the whole hour to himself. You know, I, th th this is hearsay, so I'm not sure this is exactly what happened. But my understanding is that Tom Cotton, when informed that he would be debating Ricky Dale Harrington, his legs started shaking, his teeth started <laughs> chattering, and he's like, I can't do it. I can't do it. If I get up there with one of those smart libertarians, I'm going to be exposed for the fraud that I am. Better that everybody just think me a coward. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I appreciate that as an experienced politician. But one of the numbers ahead of this debate that's really astonishing is that in the poll that got suppressed at one point in time, Ricky Dale Harrington Jr. was at 38%. And Tom Cotton was at 49%. And for Tom Cotton to be under 50% in Arkansas at this point means that that race can be won. And we want to talk about, I, I don't want to steal your thunder, Eric, so maybe I just go to you right now. Do you want to talk about that debate, what we saw? Well, I'm going to call it a town hall. Okay. That, that's a great, great thing. Let's call it a town hall because that's really what it was. And it was, it was excellent. I mean, uh, I've been following Ricky's campaign for the last couple of weeks when it got onto my radar. And his ability to really make the libertarian message digestible to non-libertarians without losing any principle is inspiring. I... I I'm a big fan. I'm a really big fan of uh, Ricky Harrington, and I'm actually going to share my screen right now. Love it. Because I've got his website pulled up right here. There we go, right there. Uh, awesome. I mean, his, his three points right there, character, integrity, and compassion. What more can you ask for? Uh, it, it is truly uh, a, a winnable race, as you said, and I highly encourage everyone. You can see on the top of my screen share there, it's Ricky Harrington to Senate.com to as in T O, not the number two. Uh, check out his website and donate. Uh, and if you're in Arkansas, volunteer, go door knocking. Because this race is winnable right now, especially after an hour-long town hall put on by PBS. And uh, I hear that they had great numbers in viewership, too. So people that never have heard a libertarian message before are getting that libertarian message. And it's reaching people's hearts and minds. And we need to make sure that that's the strongest campaign in Arkansas right now. Well, let me give you some softball questions. Or actually, I'm going to go to, to Laura with these softball questions. 
Is it too late for somebody to help a campaign? I mean, we're so close to the election. If I wanted to give money right now, it's not going to help, is it? Um, it absolutely does help. In those last couple of weeks, um, there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, besides mailers, you can do ads yet. You can still do um, radio and television ads, um, as, as well as, as uh, newspaper ads. So, I mean, um, I don't, I'm, I'm not privy to their um, to their strategy, but, um, you know, actually those last two to three weeks, um, that's when you need the money the most. And unfortunately, sometimes that's when you run out. Yeah. And that money, you know, there's a lot of things that, first of all, right, literature, emergency printing, especially like a campaign like this that catches fire. You know, one of the things I, I always tell people is that rack cards are the best thing you can possibly do as a candidate because they're cheap and you can get a lot of them. Uh, I happen to know that if you only wanted to buy 10,000, that's only 800 bucks. So think about it, you know, 800, 10,000, all right, that math can't actually be done, but for five bucks, you're helping a candidate get out over a hundred pieces of literature. It's fantastic. And that, those can be printed really quickly right there locally. It makes a big difference. And so getting all of those things together, little bit cash at the end. So Facebook ads, you know, uh, Facebook has said uh, we're going to stop political advertising October 27th, um, which is kind of weird, but it is what it is. So he's not going to be able to spend money on Facebook ads, but local radio, yep. well, people don't know this. <clears throat> um, so this is where every the libertarian... The other thing that we haven't been talking about, and one of the things that are is very important is volunteer fatigue. Yes. And, you know, I mean, you have a core cadre of volunteers and they are out there knocking doors and they're breaking their backs. It's the last three weeks where if you get them together on a Saturday morning before door knocking, uh, buy them coffee or get them a real breakfast it's going to re-energize them. And those dollars are also very important for that too, because volunteer fatigue is something is a hurdle that really needs to be overcome, especially in the last push. The other thing, the other thing that I think is important, especially in, in the age of COVID. Um, and we've seen this with a number of campaigns, including the Jorgensen campaign is you've got sort of a text messaging um, uh, effort going on. Now, um, if they've got access to, to numbers, in Arkansas, that's a great way to um, send a text message out. Say you have a choice; you don't have to pick cotton, you know, um, or, or whatever. And and then um, and, and then provide a, a link, and um, they can do that cheap. People may or may you know some people will get angry, but uh, some people will actually click on the link, and um, that's another good way for anybody who hasn't heard of him um, to get the message out. That's a great point. And, you know, I, I want to go both of those things. Uh, Eric's point about uh, donor fatigue. I can tell you a couple campaigns where, like, we were sitting call banking. And, you know, call banking, it's, it's super important. But it is, you know, you're talking to people. You're saying the same things over and over again. You get in there. And then all of a sudden, like, there's a doorbell and it's pizza. And you're like, yeah, pizza, I'm recharged. I guess if you look at me, you might see that's a personal preference. But whatever it is, you know, at some point in time, there is something that happens that, you know, recharges the volunteers. And, you know, it's little things. Uh, you know, there was a thing uh, on in Joe's campaign where uh, on the bus, somebody donated money so that there would be flowers on the bus. It's a little thing, mm -hmm. but it's something that if that's something that's meaningful to you, you know, it makes the campaign better. It's not a lot of money, but people getting in there with Ricky Dale Harrington right now, this is, I mean, I, I would say it would be the biggest upset that I can think of in, in libertarian politics, in American politics, right? Somebody comes out of nowhere and overthrows one of the truly entrenched. And here's the other thing about it, right? If we're going to dream... Let's dream. Let's imagine that Ricky Dale Harrington, libertarian, is the swing vote in the Senate, right? 50 Democrats, 49 Republicans, and one libertarian, or 50 mm. Republicans, 
uh, whatever it is, boy, that's amazing, right? It could be a huge deal. So I, I definitely encourage people to uh, find out more about this and uh, try to get find a way that you can do something to support Ricky Dale Harrington. Now, having said that, and we talked about that debate, let's talk about one of the debates that didn't happen. Very unfortunate. In Kentucky. Yeah. Okay, Brad Barron qualified for the debate. He was going to debate Mitch McConnell uh, and the Democrat. Oh, I don't remember their name. Mm -hmm. So he qualified. He had an invitation to the debate. And then they pulled the ticket, right? Mitch McConnell said, I'm not going to debate. I'm not going to come out of my tortoise shell, stick my head out to uh, debate the libertarian. And they uninvited him. And that debate was also on PBS, paid for by taxpayer money. And so suddenly the tax, libertarian taxpayer money, I mean, as much as we don't want to give it to them, at least if we give it to them, they ought to come back with some, serv some level of, uh, some sort of services. Now, I had suggested that if they do another debate and Brad gets in there and Mitch McConnell doesn't come because there's some talk that that's going to be what would happen. It would just be Brad and the Democrat that he should lay into him. And th this is the, the hypothetical that I would give. You know, it's unfortunate that Donald Trump's little Mitch was too afraid to make it here to this meeting. Okay, it's, unafford it's unfortunate that, that the little Mitch was afraid to face the people of Kentucky just because he's a libertarian on the stage. But we expose him. That goes on like that. You can imagine all the other things that we would say. They got to lay into him. Now, We've seen stuff like this happen before. We've seen libertarians not be allowed into debates, but I don't ever recall an invitation being taken away before. Has any of you guys ever seen that? I've never seen that, but um, it, it's not surprising. Um, certainly the incumbents, um, and, and, and even if they're not incumbents, you know, the, the major parties, um, you know, have, have the leverage um, in a lot of these things. And um, depending on what state you're in and depending on what the nature of the election is, I suspect, um, I suspect Mitch fancies himself as something of a friend to little L libertarians, at least in Kentucky. He's got sort of this tenuous relationship, it seems, with, um, with, with Rand Paul, um, who pictures himself as something of a um, of a libertarian. And I think that probably what happens is that they, um, that they decide that they're going to, you know, that, that, that somehow they're threatened if the libertarian gets on stage and actually, um, actually exposes them. So. Yeah, that's the nature of it. Go ahead, Eric. So actually, uh, there's a couple of things that this was really dirty politics, okay? So according to FEC rules, all of the requirements for debate the criteria have to be laid out well in advance so everyone knows. And when Barron qualified, they couldn't change the debate rules because that would be against the law. So they just canceled that debate and moved it to another PBS station and created new and arbitrary rules. Wow. Now, I will say, though, the original PBS station that was originally going to air this has now come back and said on October 26th, McGrath and Barron will debate. Yes. So, so at we'll least get to see that, that, that the president's little Mitch line being used on television. Yes. That's so at Baron will be on television. It will be on October 26th. And it is vital that we get out that message to everyone in Kentucky. And not only that, but watch it ourselves through streaming on YouTube or, or, you know, maybe Share even it. rebroadcast it on LPTV or whatever. 
but it it's absolutely vital that that we get that message out yeah i agree with that 100 uh and yeah i'm excited about that the i think that you know that's one of the great things that we have to offer not as libertarians but as a third party that when somebody doesn't want to debate you get to have a debate with an empty chair uh and that, ha- that happened to me when I ran for Congress. The, I, I did actually two debates. One the Democrat held that the Republican refused to go to, and one the Republican held the Democrat refused to go to. And when they broadcast that empty chair with a microphone on it, that makes the candidates think, uh, maybe I better show up. So it's good. We are serving the public that way. Speaking of serving the public, let's talk about the thing that we love to do, the, uh, the news quiz. <laughs> I know you guys are ready for it this time. Uh, uh, regular you, re, regular watchers will recall that uh, we do the New York Times news quiz. And they do a new quiz every Friday. Uh, that's why we do it on Thursday. It's given us uh, four days, five days to, uh, to prep up. Potentially look at the questions beforehand. None of us has ever done that. So... No, trust me, we don't because of how many we get wrong. <laughs> exactly. We're going to prove our incompetence again. All right, so the first question is, Regeneron asked the Food and Drug Administration for emergency approval of a drug that President Trump claimed, without evidence, cured him of the coronavirus. What kind of a treatment is it? Is it an antibody body cocktail, a cytokine inhibitor, a steroid, or an antiviral? It's a tough antibody, question. Antibody, isn't it? Yeah, it's a collection of antibodies. I've just never heard it called a cocktail before. I heard it called the uh, polyclonal antibody. It is hours after the, Mr. Trump got it. Uh, asked him for emergency approval. And Mr. Trump said he would soon make it Amer- available to Americans free of charge. Now, the New York Times being the New York Times goes on to say there's no <laughs> evidence that the treatment is the reason Mr. Trump was feeling better. But... I mean, they did give it to him, and he's not dead. And he's fat and, you know, 97 years old. So (laughs) for him to have survived it, I think it's pretty surprising to a lot of us. Of course, Uh, they gave him a lot of other stuff too, right? They did give him a lot of other stuff. This was early, one of the early things they got. They gave him a steroid, dexamethasone, which uh, has as a side effect that you will feel particularly arrogant. I'm not even kidding. You can look that up. (laughs) Um, I don't know how they, how they knew it was working. Exactly. Uh, they Rage gave, tweeting. Exactly. <laughs> they also gave him remdesivir uh, and vitamin D and zinc, which um, this is my free advice, which is worth the medical degree that I don't have. Um, but everybody, please get out in the sun for 15 minutes a day. Vitamin D is such a huge thing. One of the best libertarian talks you can ever go to is uh, Mary Ruart and Kyle Varner talking about uh, a lot of the um, deliberate lack of information that comes out. Pharmaceutical companies don't want you to know if you were getting double the daily recommended amount of vitamin D, you would be significantly healthier. Uh, Mm -hmm. We live lives that we don't get out in the sun that much anymore. If you can get out in the sun for 20 minutes a day and getting out in the sun doesn't mean just my head has shown up. But if you can get out in the sun 20 minutes a day, you actually will improve your health significantly. So we need more libertarians. We need you to be healthy. Please do all of that. Um, but the polyclonal antibody uh, that Regeneron made, uh, they're a small little company. They only have the capacity to make, uh, to, to bring by the end of the year 50,000 doses. But doctor friends of mine have said, that's the real thing. It's really impressive. The only bad thing about it is that uh, it doesn't make you immune. It just makes you not die. So it stops you from getting sick, but you don't have the immunity to corona that you would have if you recovered from it normally. And so, you know, it's a mixed bag. Uh, we definitely don't want people to die. I keep them alive, you know, even the president. I think all of us agree. None of us, we all wanted to see the president survive. We don't want to see anybody die from COVID. Um, but uh, one of the bad things about that uh, about that treatment is that it doesn't uh it doesn't give you antibodies afterwards all right number two after violating the health rules he imposed the president of which university tested positive for the coronavirus i'm just going to give the initials byu 
SMU, Notre Dame, or Yale? Notre Dame. Yeah, Was it's it Notre, Notre Dame? Dame because they talk about that every single morning on my little yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I did not know that. Well, it's, it's especially interesting because, of course, who's the other big Notre Dame graduate in the news right now? Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, who got her law degree? At, well, uh, Notre the, Dame. the president of Notre Dame was at the super spreader event for. Oh, was he? Yeah. yeah. So he yeah. was at that event. He was yeah. at that event. Yeah. Yeah. He was at. That's a fascinating thing because that is. So he probably was inside, because one mm -hmm. of the things that they've been talking about is sort of how most most people in the Rose Garden didn't get it, but most of the people who were inside beforehand or afterwards whenever the reception was. Or both, yeah. Exactly. Those are the people who got it and were infected. It yeah. is, uh, that is surprising. Now, I I think we'll talk about Amy Coney Barrett later on, but one of the things that's that I really, really, really like about her is that uh, it has been, I, I can't remember, I think it's 90 years since there's been a justice who did not go to Harvard or Yale Law School. Uh, she will be the first one in a long, long time. So other things aside, I, I just want to break the monopoly of those two schools on who are our justices. Uh, it is interesting that uh, that he broke that. Ah, this one's going to break my heart. Eddie Van Halen uh, died Tuesday. Widely revered by his peers for perfecting which technique? Palm muting, raking, sweep picking, or two-handed tapping? So I am certifiably tone deaf, so I do not have a musical knowledge database like I, I do. I think we're going to have to go to the audience on this one. Uh, Producer Dave, are there any comments in the audience? Does the audience know Eddie Van Halen is widely revered by his peers for perfecting which technique? Palm muting, raking, sweep picking, Two-handed tapping. I'm going to guess that some of those are just made-up words, and they're not actually uh, techniques. Tapping. All right, thanks, Lisa. We're looking it up. Two-handed tapping. Oh, the audience gets it. Ten points for the audience. There you go. <laughs> Good uh, job, Lisa. We yeah, have thanks, the best Lisa. audience. Uh, so, Henry. Mr. Van Halen's technique of two-handed tapping set a new bar for guitar pyrotechnics. I can tell you that... Uh, you know, one of the interesting things about it is, so I am a child of the 80s and watching One Day at a Time with Valerie Bertinelli was like a big deal. And then when she married Eddie Van Halen, it was like the unity of 80s superstars. And it was just like, it was this huge deal. And then they got divorced and uh, see, lots of people know uh, no tapping. I don't know how I didn't know that. Um, of course, you guys all knew it late. Um, <laughs> the, well, they got divorced, you know, it was sort of one of those things was sort of the, the end of childhood, stuff like that. I, I used to always say the world has gone to hell in a handbasket since David Lee Roth left Van Halen. Uh, and then there's apparently there's another version of that. The world has gone to hell in a handbasket, uh, since Marie Osmond got divorced. Um, <laughs> so whichever one you want to pick, but for me, it was, it was the Van Halen stuff like that. It's just a lot of great back catalog out there. I would encourage everybody to Spotify or whatever it is and listen to some of the lesser known songs. Uh, and that eventually will lead you back into the great songs. I like, oh my God, the opening to Hot for Teacher. So unbelievable. That drum solo in the beginning and then the guitar solo, just amazing. So Eddie, thanks for everything. Uh, probably, I, I, as far as I know, you were apolitical, but... Uh, mm -hmm. We appreciate it anyway. All right. This one we know, right? This one we know up and down. At least six men have been arrested for plotting to kidnap the governor of which state? Michigan. Michigan. It's Michigan, of course. So one of the craziest things about this, I think, for all libertarians is that, uh, you're right, what's, what's the number one misconception that uh, you hear talked about in this? I don't know if you guys are hearing in the same threads that I am. Are you hearing people say, well, that's because they're Trump supporters? Oh, because, I heard some of that, although. Yeah. Some, I guess. Early, yeah. early. That was the first thing you heard. Yeah. Right. I mean, because the thing is, these guys are definitely militia and mm -hmm. anti-government and stuff like that. 
But they've got all sorts of published things where they say, yeah, no, we hate the president. The president's terrible. <laughs> Banned bump stocks, all those other things. And, but I think they recognize the fact that there's no way they're going to be able to kidnap the president. Uh, and that was their thing. But it's interesting that we are so polarized that when I try to tell people that these guys didn't like the president, they couldn't believe it. They didn't understand how somebody could be against the Democratic governor of Michigan, but also dislike the president. And I think it sort of shows some of the, the polarization that's so incredible out there. And I, I know you guys see pieces of this as well. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I was just I was just looking at the comments. Sorry. I was looking at the comments and somebody is a big fan of Eric's. So <laughs> it is. Well, so it's interesting, you know, this is this is one of the things I probably should have told you guys this about LPTV. So <laughs> if you if you haven't watched Libertarios Hispanos yet, uh, we have two just beautiful announcers. Hey, Martha Bueno and Zach Foster. <laughs> And one of the things that I was really worried about in the beginning was that, uh, you know, I was going to have to really moderate the comments because I didn't know where things were going to go. But as it turns out, it's Zach who's receiving the stalkers. Uh, people come <laughs> on. They ask where there are more pictures of Zach, uh, <laughs> stuff like that. Does he have a personal website? Um, and so very, very interesting. Uh, so. I hope I haven't opened that door for you, Eric. Uh, but if you do, I hear people make really good money on OnlyFans. So, uh, <laughs> I, I yeah, first libertarian OnlyFans right there. I, I could see it. Yep. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know that you would be the first. Well, okay, uh, not first. Not first. Right. But it is interesting because uh, there was a, uh, a conversation at one point in time about... Uh, <laughs> I don't want to go into it too much, but so Daryl Perry had a uh, a profile when he was running for president on FetLife, which FetLife is sort of an alternative uh, website. Uh, and then somebody said, wow, you must be the first presidential candidate to have a, a thing. And he's like, oh, no, McAfee had me beat. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Next question is, two Supreme Court judges appeared to urge the court on Monday to reconsider its 2015 decision establishing a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. Name them. Okay, so this impacts me directly. So right. uh, Alito and Thomas, that, that is... It is Alito and Thomas. So you just got married, right, Eric? No, actually coming up in March. Right, right, exactly. So, so right. And you're going to get married in North Carolina? Yep, Durham, North Carolina. <laughs> Had North Carolina legalized it before the Supreme Court decision? No, we did not. Actually, the Supreme Court decision overturned a constitutional amendment barring it in North Carolina. That is fascinating. So tell me a little bit about what it meant to you, if you don't mind going into that sort of personal space. So... I mean, it's important. Uh, it, it's it's not only for myself. It's it's for everyone else uh, as well. I mean, just to be put onto an equal footing. Uh, I have to say, I mean, I I believe our government shouldn't be involved in marriage at all uh, because it's the love of two people. Why do right. we have to seek governmental approval for our love? But. Yep. Uh, at the same time, I mean, there's taxation benefits, there's the, the legal requirements that health insurance now follow suit and all of that. So, I mean, there are a lot of aspects that have been built into this legal mandate uh, or contractual love. Uh, but it is exceptionally important because it, it really puts us uh, as the GSM community on an equal footing with with other Americans. The fight is long from actually being uh, finished for equality, but this was a big step. This was a big step in, in the right direction. Now, you, you I have up, to just say, quick, Quickly for the people who don't know, GSM is the preferred term 
for LGBTQI, and it stands for? Gender and sexual minorities. All right. Uh, so, I mean, there's there's still a lot to go. Uh, the fact that adoption for GSM individuals costs more than double for yep. that of what a non-GSM it, couple pay. It, it's uh, harder than for a single person. Oh, absolutely. It really is. Uh, because there's also a lot of adoption agencies that won't even entertain you as a client. So you have to find an adoption agency that is even willing to consider you as a client uh, because that is completely legal discrimination in most states. Uh, so there's a lot of aspects that still need to be overcome. Uh, but this was a big hurdle. Now, I will say, you know, if you look at Reason Magazine or a lot of other uh, legal publications beyond Reason, uh, the chances of this actually being overturned Agreed. is minimal at best. Uh, there's already so many pieces of uh, judicial rulings that have based their ruling on this. Uh, so a lot of other things would have to come apart as well if this no longer stands as a Supreme uh, Court ruling. Uh, you look at the economic impacts, there are entire industry expansion uh, in the in the wedding industry that is now catering just to the GSM community. Yep. Uh, there are actually, there's a lot of aspects that of people talking that GSM weddings or, or the expanded wedding industry right now is one of the things that are saving hotels and wedding planners and venues uh, just because there is a larger pool of individuals who are getting married. Right. Uh, so that's really important. And and weddings are huge business. It is. It's it's actually one of the largest industries in the United States. It is a multi-billion dollar industry in the United States. You wouldn't think it, but, you know, uh, national average, I believe a wedding right now is costing somewhere around $19,500. Wow. Uh, so if you all of a sudden multiply that, in the United States, there were over 20, it, I'm, I'm, I may get this number wrong because I didn't have I didn't research it thoroughly. I'm pulling it back from weeks ago when I read it last, so yeah. memory may not That's serve fine. me. Our, our, but our show is mostly factual. Four thousand uh, wedding licenses were issued in 2019 or 2018. If you take that 19,000 and multiply it by 24,000, you get an astronomical figure. Uh, and that's that's huge. If you think that 10% of the population is GSM, now all of a sudden you're looking at 10% of that is thanks to exclusively the GSM community. So it is huge. It's absolutely huge. Plus yep. there's... Uh, more GSM individuals are moving through the uh, wedding process because there's still a backlog of individuals who wanted to get married for decades and never were yeah, able to. Exactly. So I, there's a lot. There's a lot. Right. Like, and, and, you know, one of the things you talk about is say, we say that libertarians, you know, we wish that government weren't involved in marriage. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that government is involved in so much stuff. And there's so many of those problems that marriage solves for partners like inheritance, oh, yeah. hospital visits, all mm -hmm. these things that were just insane. So oh, yeah. I, I had the good fortune to live in Massachusetts, which legalized marriage equality a long time ago, relatively yep. speaking. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, we got to see very early on dedicated couples getting married. And, you know, within one year, it was clear marriage is statistically as hard for everybody. It doesn't matter what you do. Marriage is work. It's hard. It's love. I, I, I've been married for 19 years. I always tell people who ask me, what's the secret to a good marriage? The secret to a good marriage. This is my, my advice to you, Eric. The <laughs> secret to a good marriage is that there is no secret. Yeah. It's it just you work at it, and that's what makes mm -hmm. it happen. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that the one government that I think actually does a really good job on marriage uh, is the French, who only have a civil union uh, and then you can get anybody once you can get a church marriage church marriage doesn't do anything for you in terms of legal rights it's getting a legal civil union that establishes your bona fides for 
inheritance and stuff like that. And it has to be renewed every five years. So, you know, it's not like you actually have to get a divorce or anything like that. After five years, you could say, yeah, you know, sorry, it didn't work out. Let's uh, go our separate ways, stuff like that. I always thought that was a, an interesting idea. Divorce lawyers will never let that happen in this country. I agree with you. There's way too much money in, that, in divorce. All right. Uh, I appreciate uh, Producer Dave moving me off of that topic by bringing up the question. Our next question, uh, which social media company announced that it would remove all QAnon content? Oh, it's Facebook. It is Facebook. I'm sure of it. Yep. Uh, it's funny because to a certain extent, uh, I have a... Uh, I, I think about all the various spammy things that come through Facebook. And the one that I get uh, is young, beautiful women who are clearly just clickbait. They send you friend requests uh, and it's completely vacuous. And uh, But the thing about it is, is that I actually am grateful to that as a service because when I get the friend request, I will click on their profile and I will see all the mutual friends that we have and I remove those people from my friend list. Because if you were stupid enough to friend that account, I get rid of it. I, I get, wish, go ahead, Laura. I, I, I get those messages from 60 something year old men who have like perfect white hair and Interesting. You know, pictures in front of the pool. And you know, and you go, you go to their, you go to their, uh, their, their Facebook page. And sometimes there's somebody else, some common friends, but usually their status is widowed <laughs> or you know it, it's usually widowed you know the poor the poor widowed gentleman sure. who's you know i don't know just just looking for for yep, for another female in his life you know you know it's <laughs> so now i have to ask eric are you getting targeted with this stuff yet oh my gosh i i get so many Russian beauties in, in scantily clad well now see oh, that's no. actually fascinating to me because i would just assume that Facebook knows, A, that you're getting married, B, that you're getting married to a man and would target you with the right sort of preference. Oh, yes. No, trust me. Facebook does know that I'm getting married because I'm already getting advertisements on Facebook for divorce lawyers. What? So, <laughs> Come on. No, I'm Come no on. kidding. No kidding. Wow. Uh, it, it is actually kind of hysterical. <laughs> We aren't even married yet, and we are already receiving advertisements for divorce lawyers, yeah. uh, which is another reason why the earlier point of marriage li licenses expiring will never work, because if they can start sending divorce lawyer ads to individuals who haven't even gone through the wedding yet, they're, they must be doing pretty well. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, no, but as far as, as me being gay... No, no, there, there is no, it, it doesn't seem to be in their algorithms yet. Interesting. I wonder if they know and they're afraid to push stuff or if they, you know, they really just, they don't care and they're not advertising it. I mean, sooner or later, the market will take care of that. You know, oh, absolutely. No, exactly. All right. But Next. does Eric really want to get those kinds of solicitations? So maybe right. it's, a, it's it I, might be a blessing that he's not. Uh, well, okay. Let let's be honest. I'm getting married. I'm not dying. I mean, <laughs> it's a pretty face, you know. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, uh, look, we have a libertarian-based question. Uh, John David McAfee, Silicon Valley legend, was arrested in Spain on tax evasion charges. What technology did he pioneer? Cloud computing, file sharing, video conferencing, or antivirus software? Okay, every single libertarian should know this just instinctually. I get, do, we, do we want to throw it out to the audience? Let's go for it. Let, let's All right. audience, let our audience shine on this one. What did John McAfee, Silicon Valley legend, what technology did he pioneer? Did he pioneer cloud computing? Did he pioneer file sharing? Video conferencing or antivirus software? I know the audience knows this. Uh, I had... Uh, you know, the good pleasure to uh, to meet McAfee. Biden, you're supposed to be doing debate prep. He <laughs> always watches us. This is what happens. Democrats steal answers from libertarians. They're like, they have for years, are... Dan. They have for years. All right. 
It's well, no surprise he's watching us. This is his debate prep. Exactly. Well, <laughs> Joe, thanks for watching. Uh, but uh, we appreciate it. But you did get it right. So you, you win the prize. All right. Next question. Uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded on Wednesday. What happened for the first time this year? Was it A, the award winner refused to accept the prize money, which I believe is a white $1.3 million. B, a scientist under the age of 30 won the prize. C, the prize was awarded posthumously. D, the prize was awarded to two women. I have no idea. I think it was two women. Yeah, it's it is. really it's unusual women. because it's, you know, chemistry is not usually the, you know, the domain for women. Mm -hmm. Interesting. We have, uh, you guys are right. Ding, ding, ding. Awarded jointly to Emmanuel uh, Charpentier and Jennifer Duna. Um it's interesting because there is a, there's a prominent libertarian chemist who's a woman. Um, trying to remember who it is. Uh, good job, Lisa, for those of you playing along. Get that stuff in there. We will uh, call out the right winners um, or the first person. Uh, who is it? I can't remember now. There's a prominent chemist in the party. Um, number nine, where is construction of a spaceport beginning this month? After six years of planning and fundraising, is it Britain, India, UAE, or Taiwan? This is for Virgin. There, it, this is their second spaceport, isn't it? it I, I don't know. If it I is, actually know nothing part, about it, and I feel I, like I, I should believe turn they're actually taking treasure. over an old RAF base and building one in Britain. Interesting. I, I'm, I'm going to guess that that's wrong to reestablish my nerd cred for not knowing it, but the equator is always the best place to do the further south you can get. And Britain is so far north. I'm going to guess India. Uh, although it wouldn't shock me if you were UAE. Uh, but I'm interested if the audience has any guesses. But we're going to go ahead and click it. And back in my day, all the technology came from Taiwan. Yeah, that's not a bad guess either. <laughs> all right, we're going to go with Eric's guess. Remember, I said India. Oh, Eric's I mean, right. Good. I'm wrong. If it's space related, uh, you can. I, I read space.com like multiple times during the course of the day. Interesting. Well, that is good to know. So it's going to be bare bones spaceport budgeted at $28 million. Uh, it's going to be owned by the local government and provide 150 jobs. So, so Eric, you're you're a guy who like you're fascinated by space, space exploration, stuff like that. Oh, absolutely, have been since a, I was a child. It's interesting. It's for me. It's one of the big sort of libertarian things that like people always come back to me and they're like, "But you know, if you're a libertarian, would you cut funding to NASA?" I always say, "Well, I would cut government funding to NASA, but I would quadruple my personal funding of NASA." Absolutely. Because Everything we can do is like the coolest opportunity. Uh, favorite sci-fi book, Eric? Favorite sci-fi book? You, you can say movie if you want, and I'm giving Laura time to think of her answer. Okay, so if it's a book, the one that I've the sci-fi book that I've read the most or reread the most is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So I long, mean, come on, for all the fish. Uh, exactly. Um, if it's movie, it's probably 2001 Space Odyssey. Those are all very good. I'm sorry I can't do that right now, Dave. <laughs> exactly. You know, uh, quick trivia, you know how Hal got his name? I don't, actually. If you transpose the letters of Hal, one letter forward, H becomes I, A becomes B, L becomes M. So they oh, yeah. took the letters from IBM, IBM and they moved it to Hal. Ah. That's how Hal got his name. All right, that's my sci-fi trivia. There you Laura, go. Do you have a favorite sci-fi movie or book? Well, I like the, I like the uh, Star Trek, the whole, you know, Star Trek universe. The whole canon. Yeah. I I agree with that. Incredibly influential in my life. Twice. I mean, the first Star Trek was just like it was amazing. I was a kid when it came out. But the second, the next generation, uh, you know, the ethical issues that they talked about. Yeah. I mean, nobody else is talking about trans issues 
right, in the early 90s on mainstream television. Star Trek does two episodes on it. It's unbelievable, right? Mm -hmm. Those guys were, they, they were just amazing. They opened eyes to a lot of things. Um, <clears throat> so, next, oh, I'm going to quickly throw in my little recommendation of a, of a just a superb science fiction book is called Footfall. Uh, it's written by Larry Niven and Jerry Purnell, and it's about aliens coming to Earth uh, and our response in, in, with 1990s level technology. Really, really good. Really good. Footfall. All I right. just want to say hi to Ryan because he said hi to us on the chat. Hey, Ryan. Thanks very much. I see the... Uh, oh, Ryan Jenkins. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> I see the little uh, Tennessee flag there. Hey, Ryan, how are things going in Tennessee? Thanks for calling it out. Um, and thank you for doing a great job with young libertarians in Tennessee, Ryan. Tennessee is a hot state right now. We got uh, Trish Butler running there. Um, yeah. Anybody else on, on your, uh, you know, we're going a little slowly because I want to get to your other candidates, Eric, but uh, I, I bet you might have a Tennessee candidate to throw a call out for. Uh, which item sold for a record $31.8 million at a Christie auction? Was it meteorite, a rare Bible, a dinosaur fossil, or a suit of armor? I really don't pay anything attention to anything that's under $50 million, just because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have no idea. Audience, you might have to help us out here. Christie's auction. I mean, I, I don't think a meteorite would go for that much, uh, unless it were like really big. It's just a rock. Exactly. Uh, well, I, and I haven't heard about it in space news, so I, I would probably say it's not a meteorite. All right. I don't think a suit of armor would be that big of a deal. There's a lot uh, of those. I could see a Bible or a fossil going one way or the other. My guess, we don't have anything from the audience yet. And of course, we have the the four second light. Oh, Jim oh, Martin says dinosaur, dinosaur fossil. You know what? I, I'll go with Jim on this one. Jim, you win. Congratulations. You are now going to be appointed to the LNC at large. This is like <laughs> this is like phone a friend, right? Right, you know? exactly. exactly. <laughs> How many lifelines do we get? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, apparently it's a Tyrannosaurus rex skeleton. So it's the whole thing. It's not just uh, like one ah. little fossil. So I can see that, man. That would be awesome. Yeah, that that's the good. famous... Uh, uh, that's Stan. See, I would have bet that that was Sue at the Chicago Museum. But man, if you could have a whole Tyrannosaurus rex in your house, I, I don't know if I'd have I would be million able to fit a Tyrannosaurus I, rex in my house. But, you know, hey. Yeah, that would be pretty sweet. All right, last question. What did Saturday Night Live hand out to its studio audience last weekend? Was it face oh. shields, money, political pamphlets, or voter registration forms? I know the answer to this one because nope. of New York state law requiring that any congregation of individuals for a business purpose needs to all be employees of said business. Saturday Night Live made everyone in their studio audience an employee for one day and gave them money. So that's an outstanding answer. And it goes to what we want to talk about as the stupidity of government regulations. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who wants to knock this one out of the park? Laura, you want to talk about how if somebody makes a regulation, somebody's going to find a way around it? Oh, it's always the case. I mean, it, it, it's kind of self-evident. You know, you ask the question, it's like, well, I don't know, don't we all know this, that, that government screws things up all the time? I mean, you know, when you think about it, um, some of the current regulations that have been lifted in Nebraska, for instance, um, as a result of COVID, they've said, okay, we can have carry out drinks. Okay, so why can't we have carry out drinks all the time? Yep. If it's not, if it's, it's, if it's not so dangerous during a time when you know public health, safety, and welfare is at risk, why why is it dangerous the rest of the time? So uh, you know we're 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 pushing for you know permanent carry out drinks. So that's one of the exciting things about this time is that we see all these regulations and government interference that's been rolled back, and we really get to fight for it because I think most people know that the number one thing that. Uh, that reduced drunk driving deaths was Uber, mm -hmm. right? It, it wasn't Absolutely, a government yeah. regulation. It wasn't Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. And I don't want to trivialize the effort of people trying to save lives. Uh, but regulations never work. 
right? When you establish a breathalyzer, people make breathalyzer cheats. When you establish, uh, you know, drunk driving rules, when you, when you establish... <laughs> I don't know if you guys have this problem where you live, but in Massachusetts, we have high occupancy lanes that uh, you can only drive in if you have more than one people. I have two friends who have blow-up dolls uh, <laughs> that they put in the front seat so they can drive in the high occupancy lane. So, it's yeah, We not, don't have that problem in Nebraska. Yeah, no high occupancy lanes. No. I, not in North Carolina either, but I remember people doing that in New York when I lived there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just the high occupancy lane. One of the one of the really fascinating things that they have here in Virginia, which is actually a little bit interesting, is that they have uh, volume-based pricing on the highways. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a fast lane that you get to, and you can only get through by driving essentially past this laser beam. And the laser beam knows the number of people who are on the fast lane. And the number more people that go on there, the more expensive it gets to go on there. But if you look at it and you see that the price is, you know, seven bucks, you know, a lot of people have gone on there, which means there's a lot of traffic. And so it might be worth it to you to get on that. If that were all private and not funded by the government, I would think it was one of the best solutions I'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. All right. So we did the quiz. Eric, I know you had some other candidates that you wanted to talk about. You want to share up yes. your screen again? Yeah. So the next one that I want to talk about, let's let's pull up the screen share here. Another strong potential may win rainwater. Going to make it rain, baby. Oh, absolutely. Indiana, you guys got to be excited because I know I would be excited if, if Henry was running for, for governor in, in my state. Now, North Carolina, we've got a great you governor. Clarify, it's Donald Rainwater. Uh, Henry is his oh, lieutenant governor. I'm sorry. Sorry. Yep. Donald Rainwater. I'm, I'm reading the website and it just it, it got me. I hear sorry. you. I made the same mistake the other day. Yep. Yep. But yeah, Donald no, Rainwater. I mean, they've got, uh, they've actually got, up until recently, they've got good funding. Uh, there are lots of billboards out. Um, obviously, they still need more money. So uh, check out rainwaterforindiana.com. Uh, they are running radio ads in every major market in Indiana. Yep. And so this is you know sort of my and bias. I, I want to pull up uh, one part of their uh, website. Uh, they actually have... Some really amazing endorsements, like from Republican state representatives, wow. um, local television uh, individuals. Uh, I mean, it's it's just it's really amazing. Uh, they they've got some great endorsements, and then just business owners who realize that the libertarian solution is the best solution for small business. And that I think also is absolutely key that, that people are, the message is getting out and people are able to understand, digest it and see how it will benefit them. And that is, that's libertarianism has nowhere to go, but up if we are getting to the point where we can actually put our point out there and have people digest it, understand it and grow with it. And we're unstoppable. I, I love everything about the rainwater campaign. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that they're, they're doing that I think is really good is that they are advertising on the radio in every major market in Indiana. Mm -hmm. Now, this is sort of an, an East Coast bias because I didn't think there was a major media market in Indiana. But as it turns out, India's and is actually it, it's a really big state. The northwest corner has you know a lot of Chicagoland stuff down south in Indianapolis. Uh, it's pretty populous. And so they're running a well-coordinated campaign, getting people in uh, to do phone banking, getting mm -hmm. people for uh, sign, for standouts, all that stuff. That campaign is doing really, really well right now. And they've, they've definitely got a legitimate shot. You know, between this race and, and the one in, in Arkansas, and those are the ones that are going to be up on my screen on election night, just watching what's happening, because I think that um, those are two great opportunities for, you know, kind of a real surprise yep. um, in, in terms of the statewide races. So, yeah, there's yeah. one other race that I right. really want to punch. Uh, now, granted, he has not 
uh, been doing very well in the polls or the last official poll. However, polling for this race has stopped. Wow. And the reason it stopped is because the two and the two old party candidates are so deep in their necks in dirt. There's no polling being done any longer. Uh, that is Shannon Bray of North Carolina. Wow. Now, uh, obviously, Tom Tillis is uh, coming out of COVID. Uh, he was infected with COVID, and uh, it, it was it was dirty. Um, there was uh, he's still saying masks don't help. He's still saying you know everything uh, about all of that. Now I'm against government mandates of masks, but let's listen to the scientists and they say that it does maybe improve oh. your chances of not getting it. So well, if your scientists are saying it, it's probably pretty good. I, I'm going to step on top of that. I think very few scientists will say that masks help keep you safe, but it helps keep everybody, everybody would agree. It stops you from being a spreader significantly. Absolutely. And, and that's the thing about it. For libertarians with a non-aggression principle, mm -hmm. if we don't know that we're sick, right. I, I compare it to, to, to gun control, right? People say, oh, libertarians, you don't hate gun control. That's not true. We want everybody to control their guns properly, okay? Absolutely. No libertarian is going to go out there and point their gun and carry it around and be an idiot with it because you treat every gun as if it's loaded, right? You show yeah. respect to other people, stuff like that. We should do the same things with our mouths. We don't know if our mouths are loaded right now. And mm -hmm. so we can treat people with respect. Now, voluntarily, of course, I'm not proposing a state law for that. But no. for me, I'm going to treat it as if my mouth is loaded. And you, you raise a very important rate. I mean, if you listen to a lot of the individuals out there, they say that a significant portion, if not the majority of individuals who have COVID will never even know that they had it. Right. You're absolutely right. I mean, you're, you're stopping the spread before it ever occurs. And that is the most important thing. So, uh, but Tillis is still talking his stuff. Uh, and not, it goes well beyond COVID, but He's also gotten his fingers stuck in the in the cookie jar with some education funding and stuff like that. And then it's on national news. I think everyone's heard of Cal Cunningham and his mistress in California, his mistress in Texas. And there's a third, potentially a fourth, undisclosed mistress now. So, um, That's yeah. Crazy. And, and let, let's also point out, you guys had some pretty good scandals in 2018 as well, right? Oh we yeah, North whole... Carolina. We're, we're, we've got this scandal thing down. I'm, I'm not. I'm not gonna. It's, Our it's... politicians are, are are horny and dirty. I mean, come on. Well, the twenty the twenty eighteen one is my favorite. It was at CD three where the guy was taking people's voter registration and throwing them away, or is that with CD nine? Uh, had to do CD the re election. Nine. That was CD nine. Do you want to tell people that story briefly? So uh, that was actually in the Charlotte area. Uh, there was a an individual or candidate that was running who had his volunteers signing people up to vote. They would fill out the voter registration form. Now there were some voter, uh, some volunteers that were basically just having them put their information in and telling them. The, telling the, the newly registered voter that we will fi or they would fi uh, fill out the uh, the the registration form uh, the rest of the way. Of course, they all became registered to the party of the uh, candidate uh, doing this. Well, and they, they took some people who said, you know, I want to register and I want to be a Democrat. And they say, yeah. OK, we took it. Yeah, absolutely. And then they threw their registration. And that was away. that was the other group of volunteers who were <laughs> going around uh registering people and whoever didn't register as a Republican. So Democrats, Libertarians, and unaffiliated, because Green Party hadn't gotten on the ballot officially, neither did the Constitution Party at that point. So North Carolina was just a three-party state back in 2018. Uh, but or, or at least when this happened, because by the election of 2018, they were on the ballot. But yeah. Um, so... Yeah, if if you didn't register as a Republican, uh, your 
your registration still got filed. It just got circularly filed. And uh, yeah, it was uh, it was quite the scandal. Uh, he actually had to drop out of the race. It was uh, it was dirty. Right. But you know, well, hey, I mean, we're North Carolina. We've got a got a long history of of uh, dirty politics and sexual impropriety to to keep up with because uh, we, we all remember John Edwards. So yeah, exactly. That's that's definitely one of the craziest stories. Well. Uh, to the audience, you guys have done it again. You've wasted an hour of your life watching Libertarians at Large here on LBTV. But this is some of the things that we got to do. We got to hang out together. We got to have these conversations and recognize the fact that in everyday life, there's an opportunity to talk about libertarianism, about the idea that you own yourself, that you should control your life. And government really shouldn't be that involved in the things that you do, whether it's you know, licensing the barber who cuts your hair or granting you a marriage license so that you can go off and do whatever government thinks of as an improved marriage, uh, right? The idea that the government defines what a family is, how insane is that? It's just, it's terrible. So thanks for joining us on Libertarians at Large. Next week, uh, we're hope going to have at least our stalwarts back and who knows, a couple of other of the at-large libertarians are going to join us. Um, you know, this is the classic, uh, I say to you guys, say goodnight, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. That's perfect. Guys, thanks again <laughs> for tuning in to uh, Libertarians at Large, and we'll see you guys next